Welcome to Handle the Daily, where men who are husbands, dads, and entrepreneurs come together to conquer the day. This is more than just a podcast, it's a movement. Here we pursue the Lord, lead our families, and build the kingdom. If you're seeking conversations that delve deep, reveal truth, bring honor, and challenge you to become the man of God you know you can be, then you're in the right place. Join us as we journey together, setting our sights on legacy, forging ahead to build a better tomorrow. Welcome to Handle the Daily, where we conquer the day together to build legacy for tomorrow. Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Handle the Daily, and today is Monday, and we have a special guest, and it's Preston Woody. Man, Preston, thank you for being on this episode. I'm excited about life today. Why? Oh my word, I'm alive. I got air in my lungs. I'm sucking air. I got to kiss my kids this morning. Well, my wife is going out of town because it's my birthday weekend. I'll be turning 32. Oh, you're an old dog on Sunday. And I uh, came, came downstairs from, from my office this morning. My kids had set up a whole happy birthday streamer and maybe cards. And I'm just excited to be able to hide. That's awesome, man. Well, happy early birthday. Oh, thank you. Happy early birthday. Thank you. I'm halfway to 64, ready to rock and roll. I'll be halfway to 90 here. <laughs> <laughs> Not too far behind you. <laughs> and we also have Aaron with us today. So, so guys. Glad to hear, man. And Aaron is halfway, halfway to 88. I'm halfway, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually halfway to 86, almost. We're not old enough to be your dad, but we're definitely old enough to be your way older brother. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, Mom, Dad, you really? You know how that happens. <laughs> I think, like, doubling your age gives you context to life. You're like, I am that old. I, think, I am I, not that old. When I think about when I think about halfway, I think halfway to 60, 64, I'm like, wow, like I've got a, I've got a lot of great life to live. Good for you. And a lot's a lot's possible. Mm-hmm. And and even if even if I was, you know, maybe maybe out fifty five, halfway to what, one ten. It's like, you know what? I can make a lot of difference. That's right. right. That means I'm forty two years young. <laughs> there you go. Do they say forty two is what the next thirty two? Do you agree with that? You know, I'll find out when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we do with every episode, let's pray. Because, man, it sounds like we're just going down a rabbit hole here. So, Lord, we just invite you in right now. And we just say, Holy Spirit, just be in the midst of this conversation as we have a deep conversation with Preston and Vice role as a husband and as a dad. So, Lord, just thank you so much for this opportunity to continue to do what we do to continue to be doing the things that you have called us to do and to be extremely intentional with it and to leave nothing on the table. So Lord, we just say thank you and be in our conversation. Amen. All right, Preston. This is a redo from the last time. So y'all like, we did this and we got all the way through and we realized, and I normally do this jack wagon joke. Yeah, I wasn't recording. Turns out I wasn't actually joking. And we were recording on the cameras, all three cameras, but we weren't recording on the audio. And actually, I had started on the audio, but because Preston likes to talk so long, we ran out of time on the memory card. So we only got half of the conversation. That is the exact reason why. And now, yes. <laughs> now we're just Preston and I have a great conversation whenever we do connect. As you guys saw recently on a previous episode on a Friday special on stewarding talents. So, Aaron. I love the question that you start out with. Go ahead and kick him in the chin. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite question that I ask literally everybody, even in interviews when I'm interviewing with people for a job, is who are you? I hope to be an accurate reflection of the heart of God. And that's who I hope to be. Who I am is ultimately a son of God. That's that's where I find and glean my identity, which if I don't, I would glean my identity from my achievement and performance, which quickly plummets me into sorrow and despair. <laughs> that's who I am. Uh, I'm I'm a son and I can rest at that. And I've learned I've learned what that means as 
I've learned what that means on a deeper level and now being a father. The reason why is like, I know to the capacity that I love my son, that I love my daughter. And I just catch a glimpse of the way that my father loves me. And the best way the other day, I, I felt like I was, I felt, you ever felt like you, you aren't, you haven't broke through with God in a certain duration of time. Like you feel like you're talking to him, but you haven't had an emotional deep connection with your heavenly father. I had felt like that. I had felt like I was running on fumes. And so I was on a drive about a 45 minute drive the other day. And I was just crying out to God and turned off my music, everything. I said, God, I just want to, I want to connect with you. I want to feel your voice. I want to feel you're close to me. I just want to feel that you're close to me because I don't feel it. Like I know it, but I don't feel it. Have you ever felt that way? Oh yeah. yeah it's, it's when you're and so out of alignment. I'm driving, I'm driving. And, and I, th- and I thought to myself, maybe it was the Holy spirit and say, how, how does my son get my attention? So that's two years old. The way that my son gets my attention is he's, I, I imagine him in his crib and he starts jumping up and down yelling, dad, 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 I need you. And I thought, well, if he, if he does that long enough, dad's coming through those doors. Right. What I do right there on the highway on 141, I started crying out to God, dad, dad, father, I need you. I need you. And I repeated that over and over again. And within 30 seconds, tears began to stream down my face. And I felt the closeness of my heavenly father. That's that's how you connect with me. And I felt more myself in that moment than I had in probably two, three months. So who am I? I'm I'm a son. And when I start to think I'm anything else, that's when I fall out of alignment, I think. That's awesome. Because you're thinking the first person that's answered that, well, maybe the second where they didn't give me a list of things that they do want to be or mm-hmm. what they do or who is the other one? Kenya. Kenya knows who he is. Said he was a son and a bride at the same time. Yep. Totally. Yeah. So usually when I ask that question, I get answers of, oh well, my name is and I said, I didn't ask what your name is. I asked who you are. Mm-hmm. And oh well, I mean my Identity is different than your name. Mm. So knowing your identity is, I mean, the only place you get that is from the father. Uh, right. No, no. So, man, like, you're a husband and a dad. Mm. Let's talk about your role as a husband. Mm. When you were a kid, was that something that you thought, man, I can't wait till I get married? Or was it one of those where... All of a sudden, here she is. I think both. Yeah. I think both. I, one of my earliest memories of thinking of my wife was with my mom on a Sunday morning because we were, as a family, getting ready for church. And and then I, I was probably about five, six years old. Mm. And I, I asked my mom, I said, Mom, I wonder what, I wonder what my wife is doing now. I, said, I wonder where she is. I remember my mom looking back and saying, Huh, what do you think she's doing? I said, well, she's probably, right now, she's probably getting ready for church too. And she's getting on her dress, her shoes, and she's got long brown hair, and, and she's excited for church. And, uh, and, I, and I, I, in that moment, my mom said, okay, well, wherever she is, let's pray for her. And we, we prayed for my future wife that I didn't know. And, uh, and it turns out that when I did meet my wife, uh, many years later, at that time, she was doing exactly that with her long brown hair, getting ready for church with her dad. And uh, and I think I, I had, and the funny thing is the moment that I saw her, the moment that I saw her, which is strange, and I don't, I don't say this, this is, doesn't work this way for all people, but I hadn't been on a date for five years. And I was pastoring, I was leading in a church setting, and I was focused on my mission, mission focused. And the moment that I saw her, like I turned, I was, it was in during a uh, worship service, second song in, I look, look to my right, like three rows back. I see this beautiful woman, long, dark hair that are worshiping the Lord. And I, and I felt something on the inside, like a leap in my spirit and an excitement. And I hadn't even, I hadn't even interacted with her yet. And that was the moment 
and then I met her and within within you know three months we were dating and then within, within three months from there we were engaged and then six months later we were, we're married how long have you been married now married for six years on seven six on seven what's that been like it's been journey of a lifetime it's been <laughs> a sanctification process and it's oh, when you you know you find the right woman when she challenges you to become a better man. And where, what was what would be one instance of that? that how she's done that? I thought I thought I was a good leader. And and whenever she enters my life, you now have someone in your life that mm -hmm. sees all of your weaknesses. All of them are exposed and they're laid out, right? And so you can't just you can't just display and lead from your strength. You have to expose your weaknesses, come to terms with them without defending them, and then still have the authority to lead. And what is that like? Well, absolutely sanctifying because I have the choice in that space. I can either become a controlling narcissist or I have the option to become vulnerable and help let the Holy Spirit use my wife to shape me and mold me. And that's the choice that I'm consciously attempting to make on a, on a consistent basis. Dude, that's awesome that you've actually got that presence of mind to understand that revelation. There's so many men that do not have that depth of understanding of, wow, my wife can actually make me a better leader, make me a better man. And they let pride rise up. And so, man, I'm just be almost seven years into your marriage. And having that wisdom and knowledge now is going to help you so much more as you move into your kids getting older, you and your wife doing more things, and just seeing God's hand on your life, man. Congratulations. I'm, I'm really proud of you, man. Thank you. Yeah, that's huge. I, I, I learned the hard way. You know, I want to do it right. And, I, and, and I'm grateful to have proximity with men who can help me along the journey. Cause yeah. That's, that's what we need. You and I both believe that a, a man in order to make brilliant attraction in his life needs a tribe, a tribe of men to belong to who will help him raise his standard, mm -hmm. show him what's possible and then be there with him and for him when he does not meet his standard. Was there a moment in your marriage where you were like, you were hearing what your wife was saying? And you were disagreeing with it. And in that moment, you were not giving her the response of recognition to what she was pointing out, even though she was right. Mm -hmm. No, I'm usually right. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that? It's like a little blooper reel somewhere. <laughs> Do you know, so like there's an, there's an, one of our family values, two of our top values are honor and truth. Mm -hmm. Those are our two top family. Values. Yeah. Our family motto is we do, we're the witty family. We do what is honorable. Okay. Not just what is respectful, but we do what is honorable and we speak what is true. Sometimes those values can be intention when e even if I am right. Okay. Which I feel like I am quite often. Most of the time is what I feel like. So even if I am right, I'm not going to lie to make her feel better or release the tension. Yet, how do you speak the truth and still maintain your value of honor and honor and cherish her simultaneously? Yet at the, yet at the same time, um, how do I honor her opinion and lower my, my certainty of my rightness? Um, and that's, that's, that's the tension that I find myself navigating off it is, um, if, if, as a man, if you are right, how do you, how do you hold your ground in an honorable way? And sometimes it's agreeing to disagree, which I think is completely fair. And, and I also too think it has a lot to do with the timing and really paying attention to are your emotions and her emotions in a heightened state. And was what she's saying coming out of the right perspective yes. and the right heart posture? Yes. And were you willing to receive it in the right way? And so, I mean, there's, there's two total sides to the conversation. But what I've, I've noticed is there's opportunities for me to say something 
and that's not the permission on the timing. Mm. I have, uh, so mm. I have, I've been married for almost 13 years. It's it my second marriage failed miserably at the first one. So Erica and I, when we have a conversation, if I'm right, and generally speaking, if I'm right, my delivery is right. So if what I, do you mean by the right delivery? The way I approach it. Because it's very easy, and I'm, I'm not, I really don't know how you interact with your wife because it's the first time I've actually had a conversation with you. But I know a few people that when they're right, no matter what you say, their delivery is terrible. No matter how, they, <laughs> you know, if I'm, if I'm having a conversation with my bride and I want her to understand my point of view, my approach is very different. If I'm right, I'm not coming in with a, I'm right, you're wrong attitude, which, yeah, really defeats the yeah, purpose. You can't talk to your woman like a man. Exactly. No, you cannot. No. So, and I've told people in the past that um, some of I, I sit with a lot of guys. I've, I've counseled a lot of guys. I've actually mentoring a few, and I've told them, I don't care if you're right. There ain't. There is not one argument on the planet that's worth winning to be right if you lose your life in the process. It is not worth it. When your argument lose the wife, what's the trade off? That's beautiful. Pride. So, when I'm right, it's blatantly obvious to my bride that I'm right. And I don't have to focus on the fact that I'm right. But I also have to be integrous enough and humble enough to know that when I'm wrong, I need to tell my wife, hey, I'm sorry, that was wrong. Yes. Just because I'm trying to prove a point. Yes. Because that's generally where a lot of contention comes from with us. A man and a wife being right. Yes. Is somebody wants to be right all the time. Mm -hmm. Invariably, either you're both right or you're both wrong. And if <laughs> I've told somebody, I told somebody, I'm like, even if you're right and she's mad, is it necessary to tell her you're right? Not at that time. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And I said, if you're right and she's mad, chances are she knows you're right. Yes. And, and there's no reason. For, I'm not going to say that's why she's mad. <laughs> I, it could be you're right and your delivery sucks and that's why she's mad. But yeah. chances are, if you're right, she already knows it. That's the powerful question, though, is defining what is the win. Is the win being right? Or is the win deepening and furthering the relationship? The win is deepening and furthering, furthering a relationship and the unity in the relationship. It doesn't matter if I'm right if I'm not a unity. So, yeah. And, and just because we have a thought that sounds logical and makes sense doesn't mean that it's always the right thought. We said something interesting a minute ago, which is extremely important, the state that you're bringing to the tension of the okay. conversation, right? Because as, as a man, uh, when, when I'm coaching men, we don't delve into naming emotions. They're, they're really about four human states that we operate in. And these are leadership-based states, but it's the same with your woman or your family. Number one, like the number one, the lowest state a man could be in is called what I call a weak state. And the Lord to, teaches the men to communicate when they're in a weak state, which means I'm, I'm frustrated, I'm irritable, maybe I'm fearful, or I'm angry. And whatever we do from a weak state is going to produce typically damaging results. So if I'm, in a, if I'm in a weak state, I typically want to, as soon as possible, communicate that with my wife. Okay. I'm in a I'm in a weak state right now. This isn't the best module or mode to have this conversation. Will you give me a few moments. Let me pray. Let me change my state. Because again, it's not your wife's responsibility to change your state. It's your responsibility to, to change your state. Also, as a husband, I believe it's our responsibility. Because whatever state we bring to the vehicle or to the household or to the team is the standard. Mm -hmm. So if we come in with a weak state, that's the threshold. No one's going to go higher than that. And if they do, they're going to really be striving. The next level of state is a passive state where I'm there. But I'm not there. And that doesn't do anything. You're, you're having a conversation, but you're looking at your phone. Your eyes are glazed over looking down the road, thinking about something else. It's, it's you're sitting in the living room watching, watching TV. You're there, but you're not really there, which is what most people live in is a passive state. And, Wow, what kind of connection can you have at a passive state? Middle, middle, right? That's the and that's the primary state. So the passive state is the doorway to a weak state. 
than the top two states. The next one is a present state, which is what I feel like we're at right now, where we're eyeball to eyeball. Like our thoughts, emotions, our minds are all right here in this moment. We aren't anchored to fear. We are very present at the moment. I'm not thinking about what I need to get to next. I'm not thinking about what can go wrong somewhere else. I'm right here at this moment. And I can fully be here. And you can feel someone's death process. Like when you're talking to someone, you ever talk to someone in, in a maybe a mixer or business in space and they're talking to you, but then their eyes go somewhere else. So potentially scan for a potential person to divert to. How does that make you feel? Like that person, you can feel that that person is not present with you. In, in those moments, depending on where, what it is, I, I've just, I've stopped talking and just walked off. I'm just like, okay. Why? I'm just disengage because... I have to understand where my time is most valuable. Yes. And I have to understand, okay, this person is obviously like checked out. Is this the right relationship? And am I going to be someone that they're trying to manipulate to get a close on? Yes. Or are they looking at like, what's the depth of the relationship that can happen? And if, and that's the exact thing our wives feel about us when we're in a passive state. Correct. Right. Exactly that. Yeah. We don't realize that we're bringing it. We just think, oh, I'm looking at this. I'm, you know, we are decreasing trust and devaluing their presence. And we cannot take for granted that God gave us our wives. Right. I mean, I was listening to another podcast and the guy was talking about at the very beginning, they had this little like snapshot at the beginning. And he says, if a woman were to admit in today's society that she needs her husband, she would be shot. And then they spend like the rest of the episode talking about how most men, you ask them, like, that have a good marriage or a decent marriage, like, they're like, yeah, I need my wife. Yes. Like, I need my wife. Mm -hmm. And based off my previous marriage, there was a season where I said that I need my wife. But that was a short-lived season. And then when we got into, got into this place where she was being passive, I was being passive. Yes. And it was just these, like, these riff moments. Right. It turns into your roommates and not spouses. Yes, I, I don't. Yes, at that point, exactly. I, I could have said, "I don't need my wife," and so I continually tell Jamie, "Like, thank you, thank you for doing what you do, even the littlest stuff, like the little stuff." Whenever she and I first got married, like I didn't want her washing my clothes, and because I'd been doing it for the last twenty years or more of washing my own clothes, and for her, it was a way she showed respect. As she showed honor to me was taking care of my laundry for me. And I remember she and I kind of got into this little conversation that almost got heated and more. It's like, shut up, let her do it. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's like, well, I don't want her to have to do it. She doesn't want to have to do it. She wants to do it for you. Yes. If what he shared with me. Mm. And so just seeing that moment helped me look at my relationship with Jamie in a totally different light because what I was doing was unfair to her. I was saying, well, she doesn't need to do this. There's not an expectation on her to have to do anything. And the Lord's like, no, let there be some expectations. Be expecting her to do stuff for you because she wants to and she loves you and she honors you. And in that, it just like, it for me, it, it shifted how I saw our marriage. And we've only been married not even a year and a half yet. But it, it shifted so much. And that happened in the first 90 days. I'm telling you, man, old dog having to learn new tricks. But I want to ask you another question about your marriage. What is something that you absolutely look forward to with Dakota? I like my, when I, th when I think about the thing that I look forward to every single day is coming home and then running past the dog and the kids, picking her up and kissing her. There you go. I love that. Like the dog wants to get, the dog gets to me first, then Elijah and then Olivia gets to me, but I, I intentionally run past them so that I can display a hierarchy of value. And that's how it should be, man. And, uh, and so some, she's typically, she's had, she's had a day. We've got two toddlers, a two and four year old and a, and a dog that loves mud and poop. You know, <laughs> my dog doesn't. And sure, is that um, your son you're talking about? Time for her. You know, he had some instances the other day. That's where dad comes in. You know, I've heard of some dads that haven't changed a diaper. What is with that? I mean, that's, that? that's, that's a whole podcast episode <laughs> for another day. Oh, wow. Okay. If strong that's, guys that can't change diapers are not strong. That's just my opinion. 
the <laughs> Let's start like that. That's really right here. When I change diapers for both of my biological children, that's a moment to be a proud dad. Mm, yeah. Um, <laughs> but there, for some reason, I don't know what it is. I can see blood all day long. Doesn't bother me yet. They're selling those diapers. I was like, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. And my ex could have walked in and be like, "What's wrong with you?" And changed it without even blinking. Like, but if I'm like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know why that's a thing for guys. I still change the diaper, right? But I would like the whole time. Just breathe through your ears. <laughs> <laughs> not your mouth, cause you'll taste it. <laughs> <laughs> but. No, I, I love the intentionality of just going from the door to her. And I think the kids, how do they respond when they see you living on her? You know, they, I, I'm, I'm sure, 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 sure to a degree, it's like, you know, one might think you're going to reject your kids and walk by them and <laughs> to get to your wife. Like the answer is yes. They need to know that this relationship is solid. And if they know that, then they can be secure. Exactly. And, and they know dad's coming, but he's going to mom first. Good and, for you. Um, and it, it's, it's not always the easy thing because she's the one that I usually have to find. And, you know, <laughs> she's had quite the day and, and, um, <laughs> and I would need to lift her spirits for a moment. But uh, have you seen that video of the guy in India that's chopping the fruit? Going, ah! <laughs> I saw this video that it was uh, this guy. He says, this is me coming home to my wife that's been with our toddlers all day. <laughs> Listen, when I was married to my ex, I came home from work one day and she met me at the front door. Or oh. She met me at the door of the apartment, right? And she was, I didn't, hadn't even gotten the words high out of my mouth yet. And she looked at me and she goes, how, you want to know how my day went? And I was like, oh, dear Jesus. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, I do. Like, yes, how was your day? And there's been maybe two times in the almost 13 years that I've been married to Erica that she's been like fuming by the time I walked in the door. And she's like, how was your day? I'm like, well, mine was good. How was yours? And like, in that moment, it's not about me because she's clearly ready to rip somebody to shreds. <laughs> Those are the moments. And I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm all yours. Give me five minutes to change or, you know, take my gear off and right. I'm all yours. Right. And if I'm not present, like you were talking about and being in a present state, she has no problem. And I've told her in the past, I said, sometimes guys are just that stupid. Call me out. Call me out. I've told her, I said, if, if, if you need my attention and I'm buried in my phone, hey, tell me. Right. Hey, you're not with me. She's, she's told me a few times. She's like, Hey, I really need you to put that down because I need, I need your, I need your eyes. I, I need to talk to you for a minute. And what sometimes it's like, she just wants to ask me a question and then there's other times it turns into a two hour conversation. But it's giving, having the humility to be like, hey, sometimes I'm really just that stupid and guess. And I just need to be told because, uh, you know, guys' brains go, my, you know, mine goes a million miles an hour. As soon as I get off work, I'm like, I gotta do this, 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 and this when I get home. And then I walk in the door and, you know, decompression to <laughs> right. It was a hostage negotiation. That, but that's <laughs> not even like, now. That's it's not that bad. That is a sacred time. Yeah. Whether you work from home and you're coming out from your office or you're coming in from your day, that work mode to dad mode time is a sacred moment. Yep. Because you're establishing as a father, like what's the tone of the evening going to be in that moment? And oh, so yeah. the fourth, the fourth state, which like we. We've all felt before, but we don't feel often unless we now put ourselves in it. Is call it peak state, mm -hmm. which is where it's a state of excitement, it's a state of certainty, it's a state of fun, it's a state of laughter. Like I know that I'm in a peak state when I'm presenting, like I feel when I'm presenting, and I'm how witty, I'm sharp, my intellect feels like it's dialed up fifteen percent, fifteen twenty percent. Things are coming quickly and clearly. Like so, when I'm in a peak state, I feel like. I don't feel selfish. I feel like I want to serve. It's good. And, and so what will we get to do if we can put ourselves into a peak state, a state, a state of high energy and servitude, we can raise whatever the state of the house household is, because it could be weak, could be passive, maybe present, usually not. We can have the opportunity to raise it. And that's what I, 
attempt to do. Um, and I don't want to be, which I have been often, I don't want to be the one, my wife having to pull me out of a weak state. Sometimes that's necessary, though. It's a week, yeah. It is. Well, I've, I've definitely been in a weak state with my wife more than a few times. But if if my wife is the one person that I don't want to have to pull me out of a weak state, then for me, I would begin to question the level of intimacy in my relationship. Because the one person that I'm 100% comfortable being absolutely at my weakest point in front of him is the Lord and my bride because that's what I signed up for you know for better or worse worse can mean worse on so many different levels but if I can't allow myself to be weak in front of my wife then what's the I mean then you can't she'll never truly understand how strong I am if I'm not allowed to be weak in front of her I think that's a good contrast and there. And I think there's a difference between being weak with your wife and putting the responsibility on her to pull you out. Yeah, definitely. And, um, and it took, it took, I remember the first time I was weak with my wife, like year one into marriage where I had, I think it, it was an anxiety attack. Like I had never had anxiety before. And so many things in my life were converging and I found myself. And, and I had I had my like walls up like I didn't fully know how to be intimacy and weak with her and I remember a moment where everything was converging we were about ready to go to an event and I got tunnel vision and I ended up weeping on her lap in a vehicle for thirty minutes like first time I think I'd ever cried in forever and the first time I couldn't explain what was going on and she just sat there with me and that's awesome to have that to know that she will let you do. That was the closest I had ever felt to her. Yeah. We we interviewed a guy last week and he was sharing an exact moment just like that. Where when they first he and his wife first started dating, that he's like, Wow, well, I have to tell her everything. And and in it he was like, I shared everything. And she's like, We'll get through this together. And and that's that's important. Like it's the we'll get through this together. Now, since I didn't know for a very long time, like being the like I love that set that say, you know, we do this together. I just told Eric um, a couple days ago that we had we had a hard season I felt about four or five years ago, and at my weakest moment was the expectation that I had that she needed to pull me out of that weak moment, and she literally was like, "I gotta go," and she left to go to work. And left me staying in there. Mm. And at the time, I was hurt and aggravated and all the things at one time. But I didn't realize what she was doing was letting me sit in my grief in that moment, which was the best possible opportunity for her to take. It was the best decision for her to make because it made me face it. I 100% agree there's a difference between being weak with your wife and expecting her to pull me out of a weak state. Mm. Because if she had pulled me out of the weak state, it would have just built codependency. Oh. If I'm if I'm allowing myself and she's and she's giving me the opportunity because that's really what it is is giving me the opportunity to sit in the weak state yes and give myself out of it or go to the father more importantly and let him pull me out of it and then I'm building a dependency on Christ instead of a codependency in my marriage and, and that's where I I miss the mark is is putting more like like Christ's hierarchy is. You've got to, like crisis expectations, you've got to love me more than you love your wife, your children, your, your life. And whenever all my expectation on for the kid, I love my kids. I love my wife, but if I love them more than I love God, they're not going to be able to sustain that weight. They can't no break under it. And, and like you're, like you're saying is my number one dependence to pull me out. Like I need to be there with her. She's got to be able to see it. But if I continue, if I continually put that expectation on her to pull me out of all my weak states and spaces, which a lot of men do, then she's going to lower her trust. Her trust with me is going to lower and my my, my capacity to lead is going to be diminished. 
Well, I, I think our society is creating a bunch of men that are not looking for wives. They're looking for moms. Ah, I knew you were going to say that. I hate that. Rise of the Peter Pan. What? What? This is starting to sound like a psychological counseling session, bro. And and and, and this has got to be not for any. This this has got to be another episode later. But like, it's important that we teach our sons to know how to know the difference between a mom and a wife, and what their res- responsibilities, duties, and obligations are as a son. And also as a future husband and really being in that place of knowing how to show up. Well, I, I feel like it's taken me you know, almost my whole life to get to a point where I can show up well because of all kind of junk. But I, I would say the three of us, I can confidently say like we do our best to show up well as husbands and as dads and we're not going to always get it right, but what are we going to do? We keep being consistent and we keep trying and pray. And man, we haven't even talked about your kids really. Other than the fact that you just buy ass and just go see your wife. Mm. By the way, I think it's amazing that you prioritize the relationship with your wife over your children. Without a doubt, man. Like, because props. Especially because I'm in a blended family. There's a massive focus of once there's a child involved, the relationship with the parents right. suffers. Right. Yep. Whether they're blended or whether they're they've never been married outside of their first marriage. There's my mom and dad have been married for um, this November only fifty years. Mm. And I've had a really, really good example of what a godly marriage looks like. You know, how an, a godly man takes care of his wife and how a godly wife takes care of her husband because it goes both ways. But one thing that I've watched my parents do for years is my dad will still, they've been married for almost 50 years. They dated for, I think, three years before they got married. My dad still brings home my mom flowers because I asked him one day when I was in high school, why did you do that? And he said, because she's my wife and I love her. And I, I've brought that into my marriage of... I. I do my best to keep her stocked with flowers because she's my bride. That's something that I did when we were dating. And that's one of the best pieces of advice I got from the pastor who married my ex and I was what you were doing when you were dating. You can't stop doing once you get married. Nope. Because you have to continue wooing your wife. You're not dating your wife. You're not teaching your, your young men how to be a godly man. And you're not teaching your young woman. That's the kind of man that she needs to be with. And I think the witness that most men don't realize they're being to their children when they're not prioritizing mama and the wife, when they're not prioritizing their spouse, they're being a witness that the kids are more important than their wife. I, th- I think what, to your point, to your point and, and to, to connect that is like, yeah, we haven't necessarily talked about the family or father element. Yet this is part of the attentional process. But we have actually talked about it because our time. I'm teaching my I'm teaching my kids. I'm I'm te- I'm giving them a place of and we want to give them a place of security. They're going to feel secure in our marriage, so they're going to feel secure as sons and daughters. Absolutely. And I think it is father. It is, it is. It is. totally one hundred percent is being a good husband makes it easier to be a good dad. Yo, I told my my dad and both my parents are pastors. They have been for thirty plus years. And when I separated and divorced my ex wife, my dad, you know, old school divorce isn't an option. Again, they've been married for almost fifty years. They've had some large seasons, but he kept asking me, like, "Are you going to work it out?" And I finally had to sit down with him one day and said, "No, I'm not. We're getting divorced." And he said. Why you have kids? And I said, because I have kids. And he said, what does that mean? And I said, I'm not, I I said, dad, I'm never going to trust this woman again. And I said, I'm not going to teach my son that it's okay to be a jealous jerk for the rest of my marriage. And I'm not going to teach my daughter. That's the kind of man that she needs to be with. That's not fair to them. And it's not fair to her. And it's not fair to me. It's not fair for anybody. And I said, I'm just not doing it. They're all worth more than that. And they deserve 
more than that. And if I can't give it to him, then I don't need to be here. And my dad was, well, when you put it that way, it kind of makes sense. At the time, that was the best answer I had. <laughs> but I've also been blessed with a very godly woman, and she's the definition of a proper absurd in my life. So on the flip side of that is I have an insanely strong marriage. I mean, we've made it through things that most couples would never dream of having to make it through. And I mean, I've told people a million times, my dad he still says this about my mind. If I lost my wife, it'd be like chopping off my right arm and I'm right handed. <laughs> so that would be a really big deal. But we're supposed to be talking about his marriage, so I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that we've 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 dove deep and I think we could go for hours if we really wanted to. But what we've hit on are some really important things that the men that are listening to this need to think about. It's it's about how we show up, it's about how we be present. And it's about the hierarchy of how God structured God, husband, wife, then the kids, and being able to show that because it gets gives us what? Once it gives the kids, once it gives the family, gives yes. them security. There we go. Mm -hmm. If you want to close this out in prayer, I would love to. I would love to. And I just, you know, in, in hearing you both and, and putting this, tying this up, is in context of like our families mm -hmm. is we go through a lot. Yeah. We have a lot of challenges. We think we're getting, we think we're getting it wrong. We think we screwed up on a consistent basis in our marriage with our kids. And, and then the next week we think we're doing great to then we, the next week we think we failed. But in, in context of the things that happen in your, in your household and in your marriage, not everything that happens is your fault, but it is your responsibility. Yep. That's right. 100%. So you don't have to blame yourself that it's your fault. You do have to take responsibility to raise this team. And the only way we can do that is being anchored to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. So without Him, without Christ, I'm not. So right. we, without Him, I'm, I'm filled with limiting beliefs and self-sabotage and fear. And I don't want to pass that on to my, my kids. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy and the divine gift that you've given us of these sacred moments. So Father, right here in your presence, just reflecting on the gift of a new day, the gift of air in our lungs, which is symbolic. You still have a plan and a purpose for us, that we're not washed up, we're not used up, that our souls, no matter how corrupt or battered they are, can be restored, for you restore our souls. So, Father, I pray that you would lift the heart of the discouraged. That you would breathe fresh life into someone who feels used to up about to give up. God, I pray that a man that hasn't maybe known or believed what's possible catches a glimpse and you show them what's possible. That there is more. There is a higher stint. And that it can be better. So, Father, we put our lives, families, our marriages, we lay them at your feet. We ask you, God, make us good stewards. Put our trust in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, guys. So, you learned a lot in this episode. And, and I, I think start asking yourself questions about how you are in your relationship with your wife and with your kids. And look at that flow of how do you go home? And are you going to your wife? Are you going to your kids? Are you going to your dogs? Or are you just totally going off onto your own? Like figure out like how do you show up at home? Just like we talked about earlier is you know, dictate the rest of your evening with your family. And so Lord, we just thank you for today. And so guys, we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Handle the Daily, where we conquer the day together so we can build legacy for tomorrow. If you found this episode impactful, share it with other men in your life. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast, like, download, and share to stay up to date in all we are doing 
visit our website handle thedaily.com and make sure to tune into our next episode. This podcast and its content is copyright of Thread Pull LLC. See Handle the Daily Podcast 2024, all rights reserved. Any redistribution or reproduction of part or all of the contents in any form is prohibited other than the following. We welcome you to download and play the podcast and share with others for personal use. Please acknowledge Threadpool LLC as the source of the material. You may not, except with our express written permission, distribute or commercially exploit the content. The information contained in this website and podcast is for general information purposes only. The information is provided by Handle, the daily podcast, and while we endeavor to keep the information up to date and correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, express or implied, about the completeness, accuracy, reliability, suitability, or availability with respect to the website or the information, products, services, or related graphics contained on the website for any purpose. Any reliance you place on such information is therefore strictly at your own risk. In no event will we be liable for any loss or damage, including without limitation, indirect, or consequential loss or damage, or any loss or damage whatsoever arising from loss of data or profits arising out of or in connection with the use of this website. Through this website, you are able to link to other websites which are not under the control of Threadpull LLC and handle the daily podcast. We have no control over the nature, content, and availability of those sites. The inclusion of any links does not necessarily imply a recommendation or endorse the views expressed within them. Every effort is made to keep the website up and running smoothly. However, Threadpull LLC and Handle the Daily Podcast takes no responsibility for, and will not be liable for, the website being temporarily unavailable due to technical issues beyond our control.